Good morning and welcome to the worship of God here at the Hills Church. It is a joy for me to be back home and back in the worship service after a restful and restorative week off. And one of the joys of our worshiping virtually is that while I was off, I got to go to church. Thank you for joining us. Your presence is a gift just by being you. And now may God create in this time of worship a holy space, a space in which we may lay before God the weight of our sorrows, in which we may release the burden of our regrets, in which we may join together in the prayers and hymns and community of faith, a faith that calls us to return to what is most true, most important, most holy. No matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. I invite you to join me in speaking the words of our call to worship. Holy One, we call on your name and sing praises to you. We remember your wonderful works. Keep our eyes open for signs of your presence day in and day out. You, Holy One, give us strength and joy. Amen. When we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given the grace and the courage to continue the journey. When we come before God with all that we are, bearing all that we carry on our hearts, God welcomes us in. And it is with this knowing, with this spirit that I invite you to join me in the prayer of confession. Let us bear open to God what burdens our hearts this day and let us pray. Merciful God, surprise us with glimpses of hope and love. Help us to trust you and to recognize when your grace illuminates a new way, giving us choices to make. Forgive our preoccupation with our own needs and our own households. Expand our hearts and our horizons. If we need to forgive others or ourselves, help us to be compassionate. Kindle in us an awareness of your spirit shining in others and then help us to always choose kindness, generosity, and joy. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear this good news of the gospel. In Jesus, we are forgiven and we are loved. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And it is with hearts, 
full of gratitude for God's grace, that we remember the words of Jesus calling us forth how to live. Hear these words of scripture that Jesus spoke. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as beneath our feet, peace within us, peace all around us. May the peace of Christ be with you this day. And with joy in your heart, may you share this peace with those around you. Send them an email, text them, call them. Perhaps even here on Facebook Live in the comments section, share the peace and love of Christ with your church family. And may the peace and love of Christ just fill you and lift you and walk with you this day and in the week ahead. Hi, Hills Church. We hope you are all healthy and well. We wanted to take the opportunity to introduce you to the newest member of the Carlson clan. This is Porter Safai um, with big sisters um, Britta and big brother Kitson. And we hope that someday soon we get the opportunity to introduce him to all of you in person. But until then, we wanted to extend some of our Carlson quarantine bubble love to all of you. So from our family to yours, may the peace of Christ be with you, Hills Church.
as found in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the good news. Friends, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, do you like to make progress? I know I do. I love making progress, even if it's just a little every day. Remember the saying of the old Zen master, the journey of a thousand steps begins with the first one. Well, to update that into the 21st century, we might say, hmm, the day's journey of 10,000 steps still begins with that first one. Yeah, even if it's captured on your Fitbit. You have to start somewhere. Do you remember the schoolyard game, Mother May I? Yeah, it's that game for internalizing backwards and forwards, going ahead by baby steps or by giant steps or maybe umbrella twirls or whatever you called it. Sometimes you even have to go backwards in order to go forwards. So as in real life, um, sometimes our lives aren't made up of huge accomplishments. Sometimes they're just little things, baby steps. But it's true, sometimes we zoom ahead, we graduate, we get a job, we buy a car or a house, have a baby, some big milestone. But most of our lives don't, aren't filled with those kind of days. It's more small things. I wonder if you're familiar with the movie What About Bob, starring Richard Dreyfuss and the fabulous uh, Bill Murray. In it, it's all about the progress of human beings and our lack of it, and how we get ahead finally by making baby steps. But baby steps add up. Kocho Solikov was a close friend of the astronaut Neil Armstrong. And when he asked him about those 
famous words that Neil Armstrong spoke as he landed, as he, you know, got out of the vehicle and went onto the lunar surface. And he said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Remember that? Well, Armstrong said that on the way to the moon, he was thinking about the game Mother May I, in which you take small steps and then giant leaps to reach a goal. Small steps. Maybe you make an appointment or mail a letter, pay a bill, walk around the block, read five pages, put on a mask, vote, water the plants, hug the child. It's all progress toward our moon, however we define it. You know, when I hit 30, I was a stepmother of two young boys, and then I had a baby also. And I was working full time, and there was never enough time in my life. So good or bad, I started reading books on time management, and I even ended up teaching it. Hard to believe. Um, but then everything in my life became one giant to-do list. And there were the A priorities that had to be done today or else. And then there were the vast number of B priorities, which needed to be done sometime, but didn't necessarily have to be done today. And then there was that dangerous category, C priorities, that could linger and linger for months, if not years, and then perhaps finally just fall off the cliff into never. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes we never get some things done. What happens? It, what happens is that life intervenes, like what John Lennon said. Life is what happens when you're making other plans. Well, as Christians, you know, we're called to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But how are we doing? Well, sometimes we have giant steps in our faith, and other times it's baby steps. And sometimes you just kind of wonder how you're doing. That's one of the benefits of having a prayer of confession in our service of worship, because we can confess our shortcomings. We can confess to God that we'd like to do better if possible. That we try, and sometimes we fail, but we try to make progress. The minister and author Barbara Brown Taylor put it this way. I thought that being faithful was about becoming something other than who I was. In other words, and it was not until this project failed that I began to wonder if my human wholeness might be more useful to God than my exhausting goodness. I love that line. I began to wonder if my human wholeness might be more useful to God than my exhausting goodness. Sometimes the way to perceive God in your life is to begin to fail. You might have that sinking feeling and that might be the way to God. I know some of you might be wondering, well, Judy, what about this morning's scripture? Well, I'm getting to it. Have no fear, it's now. Because when I kept thinking about Barbara Brown Taylor's quote about bringing our whole selves to God, of course, I started thinking about Peter. And today's gospel is certainly about Peter being Peter. Peter, the one who, got, who Jesus calls and he immediately puts down his net and follows him. But we also know that it was not a straight line Peter had his moments, remember? He denies Jesus, but he also loves him. And it's clear that Jesus also loves him, who he nicknames Rocky. And in fact, Peter, with all of his ups and downs in his faith, is actually the rock that Jesus calls to build the church of Christ. 
So let's look at Peter. In the prequel to today's gospel, Herod has had John the Baptist killed in a grisly murder. And Jesus withdraws to pray. Yet the crowds will not leave him alone. They're bent on following him. And he has compassion. He cares about them. He loves them. And so he teaches them. He prays with them. He feeds them. He heals them. And then they long for such a leader filled with care and compassion. And Jesus is very, very aware of the political ramifications of this. They want to make him king. Dangerous territory. So he starts to make decisions and act fast. Matthew begins the morning's gospel with that word, immediately. Yeah, Jesus commands the disciples to go get in their boat and just go to the other side of the sea. He dismisses the crowds, and then he, by himself, goes up the mountain to pray, to be in communication with God for next steps. Walter Brueggemann noted that Jesus didn't just tell people what to do and leave them there helpless. No, the fishermen knew what to do. But the commands that he made allowed a miracle to happen. It opened this incredible resource of divine strength and power. But the disciples didn't know what Walter Brueggemann would know 2,000 years later. The disciples just followed his instructions. They set off. Nothing so unusual. They were, after all, fishermen. They had been around the Sea of Galilee for years and years and years. Their lives revolved around boats and fish and water. But Jesus directed them away from the pressing crowds back into their natural element. But things didn't work out too well. Now Matthew's writing at 80 or 90, probably 60 years after the event. You can wonder what his source material was. Maybe it was Mark, or maybe it was one of the disciples themselves telling him the story. But the disciples were afraid. They were far from land. Their boat was being battered by big waves. What was their expectations? We don't know. But early in the morning, they call it the third watch, which is between maybe 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. They have a vision, and it's Jesus walking on the water, but they don't recognize the figure. The translation, the message reads, they were scared out of their wits. A ghost, they said, crying out in terror. When Jesus hears their cries, he's quick to comfort them. Courage, he says, it's me. Don't be afraid. It's me. Those are the words in Exodus that God announces to Moses. I am who I am. It's me. Peter answers back, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. So Peter leaves the boat and begins to walk on the water, begins to walk into a new world of faith until he sees the waves, gets frightened, and begins to sink. In the gospel story, he cries out, save me, save me. I love Peter. He's so impetuous. He he goes right into it. He calls out. He jumps out of the boat. He walks toward Jesus, his friend. But then he starts to sink. He starts to sink. His faith zigzags. This story is so reminiscent of that other story with in the post-resurrection experience when Peter's out in a boat and he sees Jesus on the beach. And he's so excited, he just jumps right out of the boat. 
That's Peter, being Peter. But in this gospel, Peter is sinking. Peter is sinking, and he lays, says, out, says out, cries out, save me. Now Jesus uses a word to reply, a legal pistis. It means people who doubt, little ones who doubt. You have little faith. And you will not be surprised to know that there are paragraphs of commentary about this word, about having little faith. But what uh, fascinated me was one of the commentaries reminds us that this is not really a rebuke. No, oligopistus is a form of endearment. It's Jesus being Jesus to his friend. It's like, hey, Rocky, it's me. Come on, you know who I am. When Jesus and Peter get back into the boat, the wind subsides. They're no longer afraid. Matthew makes the point of capturing this shift in the scenario. Suddenly, the disciples have made this giant step in their understanding of Jesus and who he is. They've had an epiphany. They suddenly get it. Matthew writes, the disciples in the boat, having watched the whole thing, worshiped Jesus, saying, this is it. You are God's son for sure. Well, I don't know where you were this week, but I was here and in my backyard, that storm, Isaias, blew through and the trees were shaking and a lot of debris came down, but luckily no big trees. But storms do come through. Storms come through all our lives. Sometimes the damage is minimal and we only get a few leaves coming down. And sometimes trees come down, trees can crash into your house. Sometimes we lose our electricity, whatever, but things happen. But I know enough about people's lives to know that the storms are also metaphorical. We all have these moments when we're out in a storm with not much protection. We all have moments when uh, we wonder what on earth is going to happen next. And frequently, it's a, a sleepless night, maybe on the third watch between 3 and 6 a.m., when you have these moments when you can um, create a whole list of things that you're concerned about. Holy One, help our world, help our loved ones, help our kids go back to school, help our teachers rid the world of this terrible virus, and on and on and on. We have so many worries, so many concerns. We're worried, we're worried about injustice, we're worried about our health, we're worried about things getting back to normal. And we give it all over to God. We give this over to God in this incredible to-do list for God. Like the old hymn, Jesus calls us or the tumult of life's wild, restless sea. Yeah. Well, maybe if we're willing, like Peter, if we're willing to offer our human wholeness, maybe we too can be useful to our God. Let us pray. Inspire our actions, Holy One, Help us to make the first step. Help us make progress. Amen.
In prayer, we lift before God our celebrations and our concerns, trusting that the strength of our joy is expanded as we give glory to God, and the weight of our sorrows is diminished as the burden is shared. Let us begin our time in prayer now in a holy silence, open to the Spirit of God with sincerity of heart and assurance of faith. Let us pray. O God, in whom we live and move and have our being, author and artist of this world and giver of our lives, we pray for your steadfast love and strength of heart upon the lives that we live and upon those whom we hold close, whose names are now spoken in our thoughts to you. And may your steadfast love and strength of heart be upon the people who we read about and see in the news, the people of Beirut, people who are waiting in line for tests or for food, or wondering how they will pay this month's rent, people who are cared for and who work in hospitals and intensive care units, people who are grieving without the comfort of a crowd of mourners to surround them and hold them close. We pray for your peace and your justice and well-being among people of greater Boston and among the communities of the wider world. May your spirit enliven and embolden the faithfulness of your church in all the world and the faithfulness of people of other traditions in any way that people are moved toward lives of mercy and justice that we know as your gifts. As we raise to you our petitions, as we raise to you our hope for the goodness that your spirit may bring to bear among the tragedies and losses of this life, we pray that you may work within us. Make use of the resources, the influence, the strength and abilities that each of us has been given, that we may join in your work and do your will as we pray, help to make us the way that you answer our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, we lift all these things. And as he taught his disciples, so we are bold to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thee overflow, for I will be with thee, 
my troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. The soul that to Jesus has fled for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its souls. That So now, friends, let's go out into that world and make progress, either with baby steps or giant steps. Let's go forth into the world and serve our God with gladness. Let's be of good courage. Let's hold fast to that which is good and render to no one evil for evil. Let's strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people loving and serving God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.